Hey guys, I have a treat for you. I have arrived the night before the Vintage TV uh, Swap Fest, and I'm going to meet up with some other folks and get inside the museum after hours for a little private tour. I just got to find somebody to let me in. Can't remember if I did footage before or not. I know I took a bunch of photos, but it was so hectic. Uh, I don't think I recorded any video. So this is it from the outside. <laughs> Obviously it's a little dark, but warehouse, main entrance over here. I think I beat everybody else here. And off in the distance is where uh, we did the presentations. They're not actually in the museum. There's uh, like a civic uh, rec center nearby. It was kind of cool, but yeah, there we go. Hilliard, Ohio. Early television museum. Sorry, this camera does not work very well in low light conditions. It's kind of a neat little area for a small town. They sort of have a nice little downtown area. So nearby there's a restaurant and they got a fire going outside and a, some sort of sport event blaring. Okay, I was just told the main entry door at the front of the building is open. I don't know which door that is. Let's see. Put this off an alarm. Huh. Cool. That is a mechanical TV. Looks like some folks are already here. Neat RCA. Foreign sets. They don't know. They have the ICO that I have. All right, let's uh, take a look through the mechanical room while the other guys talk elsewhere. So these are the earliest sets. These are the sets that had a spanning, uh, sorry, a spinning metal disc with uh, spiral holes cut in it with a neon bulb behind and a focusing lens. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the spiral dots spinning around for, through persistence of vision, formed a small, well, in this case, 30 line image, and you can watch it through a little magnifying glass. Uh, they don't currently have any running now, but uh, they do have a camera set up in this back room, and I think one of these TVs can work, but nobody's here to operate it right now. But this is what the, the camera end of it would look like, and Felix is the target. So that with the broadcast, the amplitude modulation would be would modulate the intensity of the beam, and you have to have the two discs spinning in uh, the synchronous, and that's about it. And then for sound, it would just be a regular AM radio transmission on a different frequency. All right, foreign sets. So these, I believe, are all pre-war sets, mostly British, I think. Not something I know a whole lot long right there. Not something I know a whole lot about. One thing I know for sure is that most of, by pre-war, I mean World War II, most of the existing pre-World War II sets are British. The U.S., they made some for the 38 World's Fair, primarily RCA. Um, a lot of those got scrapped for the war effort, not that they made very many to begin with. So the few that remain, regardless of the brand, they're all rare. Most of them are RCA, and there are a few other prototypes, Dumont, Philco. Uh, I'm not sure what they have here. I know they have some RCAs. So speaking of, that's what's in this room. 
so that's, I think, one of the field test units. I don't think it's all here, or maybe that's how they made it. But obviously there's no, nothing behind that slot. Field test unit, meaning they were trying out transmission and just, they, they would travel around with these sets and see what reception was like, what the image quality was like. These, this one is generally regarded as the kind of the coolest one to have because the other larger ones are all mirror and lid which are a little awkward to get used to but TRK uh, 5 and 9 super rare very very cool Art Deco looking Oh, more pre-war stuff. Here's some other pre-war sets, uh, different brands. It's a Westinghouse. So one of the RCAs, a TRK-12, that's the most common. Not that any of these are particularly common. Uh, let's see, quantity manufactured, about 100. Oh, sorry, that's the Westinghouse one which is electrically identical to the TRK-12. Uh, Dumont pre-war, 183, I'd love to have one of those. Here is a chassis, I think this is a chassis for a Dumont 180. Also be amazing to have one of these. It's so weird to see a TV with tubes from the 30s in it. I never noticed the neck on that CRT. That is massive. About three inches in diameter. Crazy here. Maybe more. <laughs> Must be electrostatic. There's no yoke. Wow. And a uh, rear projection from 1944. Didn't realize the projection sets went back that far. Some of the camera equipment. Now we get the stuff that should look familiar to you guys because I have a bunch of these sets. Right, I have that guy. I have that guy. I have that guy. Do mind Clifton, but I don't have the fancy original screen that goes with it. It's a Crosley uh, swing of view. Everything can kind of fold up and the screen comes out and can tilt either side. Amazing things to have, but you can see how big they are. Kind of, kind of tough to collect. <laughs> so, kind of a rarity. It's an RCA 630TS, which are fairly common, but it's in a kind of a full dress cabinet. Neat thing. Speaking of so is that, it's very similar to the Clifton with the chassis design, but it was meant for custom installations with a bigger picture tube, a 20 inch, and a custom control panel. I like to do that in a bar, maybe. Filco's second TV, 48-1001, same chassis as the 48-1000 that I have, but different cabinet style. Wow. Bowers, never heard of that one. I guess it's the only model they ever made. I do have both of these. They both need a ton of work. Classic Dumont doghouse. Maybe someday I'll get one. Cool, but man, are they heavy. Farnsworth prototype. 
So I have one of those and I have the K-Part, but essentially it is the same inside as the Farnsworth. K-Part Farnsworth merged and they've made some sets of both names on them. Of course the ones that have the Farnsworth logo are worth more. Video Dine, V-Tone. So a lot of these, these are the early sets, and a lot of these are oddball brand names you'd never heard of because they did not survive for very long, like Transvision, Viewtone, Telekit. Some of these sets were sold as kits because they wanted to rush to get them out of the market in 45, 46, 47. There's the Philco 48-1000, their very first TV. The VT-105 Motorola, I have one of those as well. I think it's Motorola's first set, or certainly one of them. Rembrandt. Very nifty TV from 1947. Well, nifty, it's odd for sure. Some more kit TVs from Sightmaster. I was going to gloss over some of this stuff. If you really want to check this stuff out, I highly recommend you come to this museum. Nationals, I have that one. I've got that without the meter in it. Classic Motorola and Sentinel. More Motorola's. And there's a Mac. I've got the 702, it's the one that gave me so much trouble. Ah, here's a set I'd love to get. Airline 94 GSE 3018. Cool, because there's a 45. I mean, it's got it all. It's an AMF from radio, it's a TV, and it's a phonograph. <laughs> In a very, very compact form. Also quite rare. There's a little Pilot 3-inch set. a kit you can make from NRI. Did a lot of correspondence training courses. Teletoon, I have that set. So the Emerson 628, I have the RCA 721. Do not have an Andrea. Came close to getting one, but uh, never, never could seal the deal. 803, I have the 802, very similar chassis, but this is the tabletop version. I also have that set. One of the first I ever got, probably never talked about it. And then there's this strange, kind of fugly TV. <laughs> Bizarre, like colonial American cabinet. Ah, now we get more of the mid century stuff. Of course, we've got. Predict uh, the uh, Safari, Sylvania Duet, Dumont Royal Sovereign, largest black and white set with a 30 inch picture tube. And Zenith with the Flashmatic tuner. Like a little ray gun, you'd point at the TV to change the channels. Have that, have that, have that. Do not have one of these giant rear projection sets. I'd love to someday, but uh, they weigh like five six hundred pounds <laughs> but that was that was top of the line about a 20 inch viewable area oh that's, that's probably the biggest rear projection set made back in the day and there's a scat 6011 yes i do have one but mine is in nowhere near as nice a condition because my cabinet's falling apart but that's what it should look like
bizarre rear projection set. I think mainly intended for bars with a leather covering on it. Same deal as this Scott, but in a uh, console version with radio. Same idea with the pop-up rear projection TV. More projection sets. Well, there's one gigantic speaker. <laughs> stuff. You wonder what's been squeaking in the background. <laughs> this. And here's all the early color sets including the ones that uh, have mechanical color wheels spinning in front of a black and white picture tube. Or in this case it's a drum with different colored plastic sheets that run in front of it. Camera tubes, cathode ray tubes, experimental types. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Prototype color TV from 1952. Ah, <sighs> there's a Raytheon prototype color TV, and now we get into some post-war European sets. Including the Kuba Comet from Germany. And this is all the mobile stuff, cameras, monitors, and such. And that back there is a full, full-on transmitter with all the rack equipment. Here's some of the stuff getting ready to be sold tomorrow. Use picture tubes, 50 bucks a pop. I'll be buying some of these. That's great. Yeah. I wonder how many of us have a mild form of autism. I, I do. I know. <laughs> I think I would have been, if they'd known back then, I would have been diagnosed with a little bit of that. Or I'm sure if not that, I do have. I'm not sure what the status of these is. It's changed quite a bit in the five months since I was last here. I don't think any of these are for sale tomorrow. It's fun to look. Sort of boneyard back there. Here's all the rest of the picture tubes. There's a list of their inventory online. I think they sell them for 75 bucks a pop. Maybe 75 used, uh, a little more for the new ones. You and me, we had an old elementary school, yep. you and, me and it had the metal rafters, mm -hmm. and they, the, everything was painted, but it was all open rafters, and yeah. I'd sit there, and I would follow the wires from yep. the you old wooden intercom yep. speaker, mm -hmm. and I would look at the okay. pipes covered in asbestos. <laughs> <That's best. laughs> they were, they were kind of, covered in asbestos. Yeah, <laughs> and I would look at all the rafters, <laughs> and I would watch the cars go by, because yep. I lived down the street from mm -hmm. the school, and I'd, oh, there goes an old Plymouth. You know, and I'd be like, I couldn't focus. I was, in my know, case, also interested in all the makeup yeah, of everything. I read way and put way, way ahead of everybody. 
Hey guys, here we are the next morning. Swap Fest is starting up, and first thing I saw was a whole trailer load of amazing TVs. And I've already set my mind on getting this Bendix, which is a brand you don't see very often. And this is an especially nifty little one. He has a lot of cool sets. Teletone, Teleking. I think this is the very first Zenith porthole model for there. A beast, very heavy. And there is uh, first Filco's, Dumont Doghouse. I'd love to get it, but uh, don't even really have space for the Bendix, so I have to kind of limit things. It's a really nifty Teletone. You don't see those off. Well, you don't see any of these often. Another cool Teletone. With a built an antenna. Hell, crafters push button suitcase set. And all the excitement over here is because there's a Natalie Kalmus. Seven or eight different cabinets. Yeah, the feet are a little rough, but and, um, not bad. They can be solved. Yeah, oh, yeah. all things considered. <laughs> are you Bob? I am. <laughs> Beautiful blonde Zenith porthole, RCA 621. Uh, that is a Hoffman. I have a very similar one, but without the nice doors. See the queasy vision with the green safety cover. A little Sony mini TV. We would just the VHF tuner. G locomotive, automatic, I'd love to get it, but uh, just can't make it happen. Those are pretty rare, very rare. Some test equipment. Huh, that's a Philco. Interesting, that's got to be from the Philco Ford era. Mid 60s, I'm thinking. It's cool. <laughs> I like it. I think it's cool. What do you put in it? Your marijuana plants? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was from California, so sure. stands a reason. <laughs> I wonder if the uh, emanations from the TV would help her into the plant room. You know, I would be in the school of thought that it probably actually would help. Things are winding down. Uh, I didn't intend to buy sets, but uh, you probably won't be surprised here that I did buy some. Got a picture tube that I hope will work in the British Echo set. Got some knobs. And I couldn't resist picking up this Majestic. Never seen a Majestic T. Well, I've seen them, I've never had one. A leatherette covering, big light front. I like the weird sets. So this will go nicely with the Bendix I also picked up. And hey, for 30 bucks, how could I resist? Well, some of you guys commented on the photo I posted of some of the stuff. Not all the stuff is for sale. This is, um, these are all sets from the museum. Some of the stuff's going to be auctioned off. Uh, but it's cool to see. And some of them are marked as museum property, not for sale. Uh, and one of you guys asked about that. Those are Transvision sets. I think they were kits uh, right after the war, like at 45, 46. Not for sale, I don't think. So the last thing I'm doing is digging through the picture tubes there for sale to see if any will work with predictors. Uh, otherwise, that's going to be it from the swap meet. I'll do some videos on uh, the stuff I picked up when I get back home. Thanks for watching.
Uh, hey guys, just got back from the early television museum swap fest. Uh, I'm loading the car. I wanted to give you a little peek at what I picked up. So this is a rather messed up holiday. I already arranged the purchase of this before I even went there. Not a single knob is correct. Picture tube apparently has a short in it, but the screen cover appears to be good underneath the layer of crud. And the cabinet is sound and uh, basically I bought it for spare parts is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, next up, some of you may recall, oh, 10 years ago, 8 years ago, I bought an Emerson 639 little 7 inch set. Desirable, collectible, well designed, well engineered uh, TV. But uh, the one I got at a swap meet um, had... Had it, uh, rodents living in it and it had corrosion and just kind of cruddy. Uh, there was one there in excellent condition for 10 bucks, just, just the bare chassis, so couldn't say no to that. I think it's all there. Ah, uh, all right, so 21 inch predictive picture tubes are essentially impossible to get. Uh, you have to get lucky or pay a lot of money or both. Well, the ETF sells picture tubes regularly. You can go there any day of the week, basically, or and, and buy them in person, or you can uh, buy them online and pay the shipping, and they'll send them off to you. Uh, but, of course, they're picked over for the predictive CRTs. But they had a few 21s that I could not find any data on whatsoever, including this 21 GTP4. So we pulled the numbers out that I couldn't find any data on, and just visually took a look at them, and yeah, this out of the lot, this was the most predictive looking one. Pretty sure it's 110 degree deflection angle, it's got a pretty short neck, not quite as short as a predictor. Uh, but, notice it has a steel band around it, this has an, um, a tension band for implosion protection on it, and it has these ears. I was told by somebody who has many years of experience uh, working on TVs that um, should have no problem cutting those off with, say, a Dremel tool, uh, a metal cutoff wheel, and leave the, you have to leave the band on. It's there, to, uh, well, to keep the picture tube stable, um, and then it should fit. It should fit in one of these. Uh, we shall see. I don't know what the specs are. Most picture tubes are 6.3 volts. <laughs> Most 110 degree picture tubes of this shape uh, electrically are pretty compatible. The pinout might be a little different. We're going to have to experiment. Uh, amazingly, thanks to Dan Jones, we have a replacement shield for Randy's uh, Continental Tuner, the one I recently restored. This 17 BP4, I think, will work in the British uh, Echo 267, uh, I believe. It's a 90 degree, 17 inch, just like the Echo has. Uh, the specs are a little different, the filament is different, but uh, I think, assuming it fits, should be able to make it work. Uh, this is a chassis that Dan Jones also uh, generously donated to my causes of restoring TVs. Um, some set got parted out and he saved the chassis, I believe, and I don't know anything about it. It appears to all be there. Uh, definitely use spare parts for Admiral TVs, including the metal back. There were several sets that that could fit into. Uh, this it may look like a Bakelite Admiral TV. They made a tabletop 12 inch. It looks somewhat similar, but no, this is a Majestic. A rather unusual construction. The cabinet is coated in faux leatherette. Tolex type material, and the front is a screwed on piece of Bakelite. It's 10 inch, so it's very early. Uh, these I've never seen one of these in person before, except at the museum. I got a great deal on it, so here it is. Uh, this is a gentleman who uh, inherited uh, a collection, and he's been tra traveling the country back and forth the last couple of years, gradually selling it off. In some amazing sets, I got a bunch of photos. Uh, I'll uh, include a link, including a head of Natalie Kalmus, a uh, beautiful blonde porthole, and while well, he had this Bendix with cool push button tuning and doors that uh, in pretty nice shape. 
It's actually not, the, the early television museum has one of these, and this is actually nicer than the one in their collection. So, I was very, very glad to get it. I've seen these before. I know they don't come up often, and often the control area is pretty messed up. But this one looks to be in really good shape, so I'm excited about that. Ah, uh, knobs, boy, they had uh, a great deal on knobs, five bucks a bag, so I got a whole bunch of TV knobs. Uh, tubes, buck a piece, but uh, a bunch of tubes that I needed. Uh, and I got some predicted knobs, you know, those I had to pay a little bit of a premium on, but I know I need some for some of the up upcoming restorations, so I bought them. I bought them. Uh, so yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. I wasn't really planning on buying anything, uh, but the deals were too good. Uh, for example, this picture tube, they were they had a sale on used picture tubes, 50 bucks pop. And it tests amazingly well. It tests like new. This one is new. I uh, got it for 70 So, you know, I keep telling people, if you need picture tubes and you can find one that's compatible, get your butt over there. Uh, so much cheaper than... Um, than other sources and uh, so much better to see it in person they test it before you take it home uh, so much better than gambling with shipping it uh, so <laughs> now challenges to get this inside and find a room for it <sighs> all right so primary objective achieved which was to get some parts I needed for upcoming projects. In particular, Predicta parts. Ah, so we have a parts set. Have some new old stock replacement knobs for the sides of a holiday set. We have a new picture tube, I hope, for the Echo. Sorry about the bad lighting. It's nighttime. Uh, and some uh, parts chassis and uh, tubes and knobs. Basically, odds and ends. Oh yeah, and uh, tube shit. Odds and ends to complete parts. And that's that's where you go. They have chassis, and it's an incredible resource if you want to get involved in this hobby. Uh, primary reason, actually, I went there was to socialize. Uh, to see some friends I had made recently and see some folks I hadn't seen in a while. Uh, and to, to see the amazing stuff at the museum. And, uh, well, it doesn't hurt to pick up some stuff too. And finally, a couple cool new sets for some upcoming interesting videos. <sighs> I've been thinking my goal lately should be, since I have so many sets, sell off the duplicates. And uh, after this latest batch of sets for customers to start doing the unusual sets one by one. And uh, I don't think we need to see any more VT-71s and such for a while. <laughs> uh, man, I am a little burned out and kind of rambling at this point. Uh, now the fun part too is I get to research these sets because I don't know really anything about the electronics in either one of these. Other than, I'm pretty sure they are not going to be clones of uh, other contemporary sets. Uh, Bendix in particular was uh, an aerospace contractor, or a defense contractor, and they made quality stuff. I've seen some of the radios and I was impressed. Uh, so I'm hoping a TV is also equally impressive. And I can't wait to see how the heck this push-button tuner works. <laughs> it looks like a car... Uh, Old AM uh, car radio push button, you know, for the presets. Funky, funky stuff. Hey, jupes. Huh, so, I think that'll be it for now. I hope you enjoyed uh, this look at uh, <laughs> some stuff I picked up recently. This is definitely going to become an annual pilgrimage. So they have the uh, the big meet in May where they do the auction and it's a multi-day event and presentations and so on. Uh, this is a recent thing they started doing where it's just for a few hours in the fall. Uh, 
I think mostly to <laughs> let people do it because well, there are plenty of side deals with people trading stuff or scrounging uh, parts before winter sets in. Uh, so I, I think it was a success for sure. Thanks for watching.